Next one. Okay, so we talked in the first uh, chapter about uh, standards that we're governed by. Uh, NFPA 1670, uh, Management of Extrication Operations. And NFPA 1500, which is the uh, standard for health and safety, at, uh, standard on fire department occupational standard of, of safety and health program. Okay? Know these standards. Okay? There's not too many of them. Okay? So 1670, 1006, 1500. Okay? Know them. There will be a question on standards, I guarantee it. Okay? Probably not going to be a whole lot. But know those three standards for sure. We don't have to worry about the Homeland Pre Security Presidential Directive, okay? But who else are we governed by here, outside of NFPA? What's that? OHS. Okay. So we are governed by OHS. Everything we do, if somebody gets hurt, okay, uh, Trump isn't gonna. His directive isn't coming after us. But OHS is certainly going to. Uh, is certainly going to investigate. Okay, next slide. And next one. Okay, so basic facts about safety requirements for extrication incidents. We are on page 32 of your text. All right, so training, operational assignments, medical component, rehab. Mitigating potential hazards, incident safety officer, and personnel accountability. That's what we'll go over the next few slides. All right. Uh, two more. Okay. Training provides essential knowledge to rescue personnel. Using the appropriate tools and techniques. We talked about that a little bit already, right? Don't use, the, don't use tools just because you think you want to. Use it because it's going to be effective. All right. Proper techniques, where do you stand? How do you operate it, okay? Uh, SOPs and in pre-incident plans. Uh, if you go to an accident, at the, so Mundare is a classic example, okay? You guys have tons of accidents at 16 and Highway 15. I have no idea how, because it's the most wide open corner, but there's accidents there, okay? So do you learn every time that you go there? Do you learn some more things, just like we do at incidents, right? So you can do pre-plans, okay? It's kind of pretty difficult to do pre-plans for uh, traffic incidents, okay? But in the same token, if you constantly have incidents somewhere, you start thinking about, you know, okay, what would I do? What would I do? What would I do, okay? If I was in charge of this situation, what would be my priorities, right? Okay. Uh, if we have an accident at 30, 36 and 16, okay, what's always a consideration that a lot of people don't take into, into thought and you can't say anything? Railway line. Railway line, okay. How far are we from the railway line? Because you know what? They, CN doesn't know that we have a traffic incident unless we tell them. So if we're, if we're near and we've got people moving around there, okay, CN does not like it when they come barreling through over the hill and all of a sudden they see lights, okay? What's their first thing they want to do? Hit the brakes, okay? And they, that's, and they don't need to. So we phone them. Does it have to be incident command that phones? No. Okay, what? RCMP officer. Can you phone CN quick? There's the number. There's our location on the pole, okay? Lots of police officers don't realize that the markers on the train tracks are right there. So is the number. That's all you got to give them. They don't teach them that in depot, okay? Because they've got other things to deal with. We know that. Again, now that's resources, okay? Uh, function as a team member, right? What's our number one bad F word in the fire the fire service? Freelancing. Freelancing, okay? When you're an officer, especially as from an officer's perspective, okay? I need to, I have certain tasks that are coming down the chain. People need to be assigned to those tasks. If someone's MIA because they're off, you know, what they, they're doing something they think is functionable, which isn't, okay, it's not operating as, as a team. 
Okay, does everybody like to run the jaws to at a vehicle incident? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You I, I would say you're a liar if you said no. Okay? Everybody wants to do that, right? It's just like you had a house fire. What do people want to do? Everybody wants to be attacked. Okay? Can everybody be attacked? Yes. No. <laughs> no, you can't. Somebody has to okay, until somebody comes up with self self tagging hydrants, okay? And a system where you don't have to do BA control, okay? Or some, uh, you know, people need, we have to work as a team, okay? Um, and your role within your SOPs, okay? So if your job is to do this, uh, a certain task of your job when you get on scene, if your officer says, uh, Emmanuel, I want you to do an inner circle call and I want you to do an outer circle. Jordan, your job is to get out tools, tools and cribbing with these guys, okay? It's not, well, you know what, Colin, you know what? I'd rather do the outer circle because, you know, there might be some blood in there, but, you know, that this is how we do things, okay? Functioning as, as, a, as a team and knowing what your role is. Next slide. So as an officer and when you're doing scenarios, you may be put as an officer of a rescue truck. You may be put as an officer of... Fire suppression, okay? You might be put in charge of uh, medical, okay? I don't know what the evaluator, how he's gonna do that, but you may be put into that situation, okay? When you're assigning people, do I have the right knowledge, okay? Do I wanna put three juniors and my oldest living member on the department as my attack crew for a rescue? Probably not, okay? You wanna try and avoid that. Okay, experience. Again, you guys have the training, we'll have the training now, okay? Just because you're trained doesn't make you any expert in vehicle X, okay? I am certainly not, okay? When I take command, okay, I wanna look, when I, as assigning trucks, okay, I wanna look for guys that have some good mechanical knowledge to be officers of my rescue truck, why? Guys that have worked on cars their entire life. Nobody's better at taking them apart. What's that? Nobody's better at taking them apart. Knows what's going Nobody's better at taking them apart, and the guy who's got the knowledge of putting them back together. Hey, okay? Cody, parts man. Hey, okay? probably been through. Uh, just, well, unless it's a Chevy or Dodge, you don't know much about them. But a Ford. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're, I you're the man. Say where everything is. <laughs> okay, but yeah, people know. Certain people have have strengths and qualities. Some people are great operators, okay? And you learn that as comes through time. So there's some people that you would just trust that can be your attack group. You're going in, getting the job done, and coming out, okay? You, you'll learn that as, uh, as it says, a senior 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 uh, firefighter, and you get into officers, okay? You start to learn who is capable, who's got knowledge, got the experience, the skills. That's the people you want on your truck, okay? Doesn't mean that you don't let anybody get on there, but you got to give everybody some opportunity, and that comes with attendance of practices and a training, taking these courses. Okay, you're not exempt from it. You know, just because you're a mechanic doesn't mean you don't come to this course. Okay, physical strength and stamina. Okay, if somebody can't lift the jaws, that's probably not the person you want on your tool crew. Okay. Sorry to say it, but that's just the way it is. They're heavy, okay? Are they getting lighter and lighter and lighter? Yeah. Our tools are exceptionally heavy because they're old, but the newer ones now, they're getting a whole lot lighter, okay? We had a town, we had a female town counselor that cut open a car last year at our Texas 4000 thing with the, with the little electric combo cutters. She said they were heavy, but she was doing, she would do it. Then you hand her the you hand her our spreaders we have right now, and you're not letting go of that because she's dropping it on her feet. Okay, physical strength and, and stamina is very important. Who can do that job? Okay, emotional strength and stability. Can we gauge this? Tough. Okay, every situation is different. Okay, I've gone to calls with what who I consider some of the most emotionally strong people that you could possibly. Imagine that one specific call because 
And, you know, the, the call we had was a fatality. And the exact same, that officer had a daughter who had owned a very similar car, very similar age, and was killed in the vehicle. Emotional stability, out the door, okay? And that can happen to all of us, okay? And I'm not exempt for, from it either. Uh, get, getting to a scene and crying people all over the place. All right? Can you can you handle that? Again, you know what you don't you don't know. But what? A, how do we combat that? Just a brief. But I'm looking for something else. The T word. Close. Okay. 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 Maybe there's some. You know what? If something bothers me at a call, and there certainly might be, I don't know. But you know what? Maybe Chris can. Maybe Chris will step up and say, "Hey, you know what? You do you want me to take this over? Yeah, you know what? Maybe I could do something else. Because you know what? I'm not exempt from doing traffic. I'll go out and hold a sign. Jay, if Jay says communication. Yeah, good one, Jay. Communication, talking about it, right? But like I say, if something bothers you at a scene, okay, we are not mind readers. When we have a big scene like this, if something's bothering you, tell someone. Tell your officer. You know what? Okay, I I don't know if I can handle this. Okay, a good officer is going to say, okay, you know what? Stop. What can I do? Who can I replace this person with? There could be a very capable person on the traffic control truck that uh, could come and do this job and have some. And, and we've seen it. We've seen people come to accidents. Yeah, yeah, I can deal with this. Oh no, no, uh, I, that that one's sticking in my head now. Okay, you know what? But you only got to say say something. Does it always happen? No. But again, this this is culture. Uh, what I had just learned in Vancouver uh, was a lot about our culture, the way our fire department shifting. You know what? The baby boomers they would never have ever said, you know, uh, this you know this call's bothering me and I need to be reassigned. That would never happen twenty years ago. That is almost a norm now. If something's bothering you, people are not afraid to talk and say, you know what, can I just be reassigned? Yes. And officers now are learning that this is the norm. It's not suck it up, buttercup. Okay, yeah, you know what, I'm not going to ask any questions. Because, you know what, maybe, like I say, maybe that car just resembles your child. Maybe that car resembles your dad. And that person is a fatality. It looks like your dad. Who knows, right? There's just, there's no way of telling it. And that's, the scene is not a time now to start figuring that out. You know what? You can replace people. But again, those are the skills uh, officers need when we're making assignments. Yes? John says, continuing observation of fellow firefighters or subordinates after the call is important as well. Absolutely. So we talked about the after, uh, after action review, the AAR, okay, with our debrief. Okay? It's very critical. After any kind of a fatality or bad accident, we need to be talking about it. <clears throat> can can the chief see every person that was on that call all the time? No. Do we hang out all the time? No. Okay. Do you hang out together in groups and talk? Absolutely. Are you gamers together? Yes. Okay. Do you go for barbecues together? Yes. Those are the times that you got to start being programmed to be able to understand that and communicate and learn and watch. Okay. The resources are all there, okay? But again, we have to we we have to be able to notice other people that are close to us. But again, and and this is a this is a touchy subject with me, okay? Because I'm in this middle gap between the baby boomers and the millennials, and we had some really good discussion at the conference about this. Is that I'm starting? I know now that uh, when people address stuff. You know, I will, I will, I will help them deal with it right away. But I am not a mind reader. The baby boomers, okay, our previous chief, okay, he would have sat with you for hours and hours on end. He'd invite you to his garage, have a chat if someone was bothering you. That is the baby boomer mentality, okay. Not that I don't care, okay, but I, I'm not. I'm not in a position. I'm not a counselor. I'm not gonna. If you're having a tough time, I'll sit and listen to you. Okay, but at some point, you know what? I'm going to steer you in a direction to get you the right help. I'm not going to, you know, have you sit in my garage for, you know, ten hours and, and start going over, you know, 
all the problems because I'm not a counselor. That's not my generation. That's not who I am personally. I'll sit and listen, okay? But again, we're all different that way. So I don't know, that, did that kind of answer your question there, uh, John? But that, was, that was a good... I'll let you know. I'll let you know. I'll let you know. Okay. Next slide. We could talk about that kind of stuff for hours and hours. <clears throat> so do we put ourselves in risk? Absolutely. Okay. Traffic. We talked about the dangerous goods, uh, uh, biohazards, uh, all kinds of things. We need EMS on standby. Okay. Now, in our world, EMS is always usually there, 99.9% .9 of the time. Ambulance is there or on their way there, okay? Usually EMS gets dispatched before fire does to motor vehicles anyway, okay? And then, then we get dispatched, okay? But for for our safety, we need to have somebody there. Is this, was this why we also train our own people, okay? Our, our safety first and foremost, okay? So if something does happen, we've got medical capabilities that we can uh, we can assist our own our own people. Next slide. <clears throat> Rehab, okay. Rehab is very important. Just uh, just because it's not a house, every call that we do, house fires, grass fires, medical calls, okay, we have to have rehab, okay. And that could be due to that could be due to a lot of things, all right. We're doing a, a large amount of heavy exhaustive work. In a short amount of time, okay, and it's hard on the body. That's why we're always preaching physical fitness. <laughs> See me sucking my gut in, John? <laughs> All right. Okay, physical fitness also gives mental fitness. All right. Is he making no, I eat that, that the curse is moving around the wall oh. like he's thinking. Waiting the tongue. I can see it from here. <laughs> Okay, so we need uh, need to do to, to heavy prolonged labor. Okay, we want to provide rest and uh, rehydration. Okay, <clears throat> and the frequency of the visits varies. So, what's our protocol for a structure fire for rehab? After two bottles, it's mandatory that you go to rehab. And what else is it mandatory? You get a medical evaluation. That's mandatory. That's in our policies. And the EMS has the all the forms. They've got their algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Okay. They got the forms. They got the algorithm. They have their process that's documented. Do we have a process for for vehicle rescue? Not as not as it's not, not it's not strategic and written and rigid like that. Okay, but when so do we have a protocol that says when it's minus forty and you're on traffic, you'll spend no more than ten minutes. On traffic, do we have a written policy? Right. It, there's something in there in regards to switch. Oh, but didn't say this. It's it's there's no time, the right? Time. You'll con Yeah, it's written that we'll switch people yes. out. Okay. Again, that's discretion. If it's not windy and somebody's moving around, okay. And I've seen people out there. You know, there's not busy traffic. If it's not busy traffic, do we have to have someone out there? Again, maybe not as many. Maybe yeah. Again, every situation is different, okay? But we have to make sure, whose job is it to make sure that that happens? I see. Again, I see. Can he delegate somebody? Yes. Yes. You know, and, and say to the officers, you know what, if Chris, if it's your truck that's in charge of traffic control, you know what, I, is that something I have to remind Chris about now? No, okay? Uh, when, it's super. If it's super hot, do I have to go and remind officers? You know, tell the guys to take their bunker coat off. Most of them know by now because you know it. It's just it's been kind of ingrained in us, right? Do you need your bunker coat on? You know, on a nice on a super hot day to vehicle extrication. If you're not near the car, you know what? Your vest is just as good, right? Okay. Next slide. Mitigation of of potential hazards. Okay, they, and they can delay the uh, the extrication. So you know, we talked about things. So vehicle vehicle traffic, we're on page thirty four. Downed electrical lines, leaking vehicle fluids, flammable gases, broken water mains, sanitary sewer lines, 
Not sure how that happens in a vehicle yeah, incident, but possible to be hauling it. Could be hauling it, yeah. We've got that. Uncontrolled release of toxic and corrosive hazardous materials. Whose emergency is, when there's a vehicle collision, whose emergency is it? Not ours. Not ours. That's the toughest thing to try and get through to people, okay? And it only comes, it comes when the liability falls on your shoulder. It ain't my emergency. And it's not your emergency, it's their emergency, okay? What if it's your family member? Whose emergency is it? Still there. Still theirs. Is that a tough, tough call to make? Absolutely, okay? But that's when you start seeing things as people running in, okay? That mentality that, you know what, I've got to go help the person, okay? Again, it's about our safety. Um, so just, I mean, you guys can think for hours and hours probably on potential hazards, but those are some of the key ones, okay? Leaking vehicle fluids. You don't want to go, we don't want to put everybody near that until we know it's not going to compromise our safety, okay? Uh, next one. An incident safety officer is required in every in in extrication. This will be a question on the test, I can guarantee it. Of some sort around a safety, is a safety officer required? Okay. They will ask some kind of a question, a very, that'll be a true or false, or they'll come up with some, what is required in every incident, uh, every, every extrication incident, and they'll list off, you know, Donald Duck, safety officer, uh, a tool operator, that is the one that is required, okay? The personnel accountability systems, next slide, okay, must be used in the hazard zone, okay? I somewhat disagree with this, okay? Because what is our scene? Is our scene an entire hazard zone? I believe so, okay? So, unless, I mean, it doesn't matter where you are, like, I, I think we're, we're always in a hazard zone. Until we're back at the base, okay, we're in a hazard zone as far as I'm concerned, okay? So, uh, the accountability may be incident safety officer's duty, okay, maybe up to them. I don't like that, okay, because that make, that puts that incident safety officer, okay. If we have a large scene, all right, we could have vehicles that are 100 feet apart, okay, can a safety officer see everything? No, okay. Safety should be, belongs on each person and it belongs on that truck officer, okay. Personnel must be trained. All right, so accountability. What is our accountability? What, what, in our department, what's our accountability? How do, we, how do we make sure people are accountable? When you're finished a task, what do you do? Go back and report to your officer, right? Uh, do we do regular PARs? No. And a PAR is a personnel accountability report, okay? In a big fire situation, okay, I would probably program myself, because I know about it, is to do a part. Every once in a while, do a part. So that tells me is every truck that's here, give me an accountability report. Do you, do you have all your people? Do you know where they are? You know, and the part doesn't mean that they're there at your truck. It just means the officer knows where they are. I've got two people that are on attack, and I've got... Uh, one that's feeding hose, and I've got one that's doing VA control. I know where all four of my people are. Another truck might be, I have two on ventilation, I have one on ladder, and I've got one that's doing a safety watch specifically for that. There's my four people, okay? It doesn't mean you have to be there right there with them, but you know where they are, okay? And this is something that really we need to do more often, is prepare accountability during training. Practice it during training because then it comes second nature when it comes time to uh, uh, for the actual call. Setting my timer here. So. All right, next one. Next slide. Next one. And next one. Good. All right. 
What's our first What's our first communication above a scene? Pre alert. Pre alert. Dispatch, right? We get a call. Traffic incident, okay? When we see traffic incident on our phones, okay? Uh, do we know if it's dangerous goods? No. Do we know if it's a structure fire? Well, yeah. yeah. Hopefully, the person is called in, okay? But the traffic, the traffic incident went into a house and has now started a structure yeah. fire. It's possible, right? But you get in that mindset, structure or vehicle incident, right? So, uh, manual traffic incident seventy seven comes in. What's the first truck you're thinking about sending out? Rescue, okay? We know that, okay? You differ? No. Grass fire. What's the first truck you send out? That yeah, sure. T two work. T3, T2. I prefer T2 because you know what? It can get there fast and it's four wheel drive. Okay. Tanker 3 is our water supply. Okay. But so did you learn that through experience or was that just a guess? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we get information from dispatch. Uh, we've had those calls where the phone keeps going off and keeps going off because they're giving more and more information as the call comes in. <clears throat> dispatch does not sit there and wait for the entire call to end and then say, okay, well, I'll let the fire department know because anybody who knows about the computer-aided dispatch system and has watched it, as the call comes in, what is your emergency? My house is on fire. They know that it's 69, structure fire. Bang, and the pre alert's coming up. You know, or when somebody phones and is screaming, my house is on fire, wow. pre alert. Okay? Now they're entering some information, okay? They don't want to send out a structure fire until they got some sort of an address. So then they start typing in an address. Wow. Bang. We got information. It's now a structure fire. It's at this address. Perfect. Okay? Thirty seconds later the caller has told them that my mother in law is trapped in the basement. Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you get that more and more information. That, from an officer perspective, this is vital because this should start getting the wheels turning, the cogs. Okay, what do I need? Okay, when you see a traffic incident and they say three vehicles, multiple patients, okay, that doesn't mean go into a panic frenzy. That means, all right, I need, what am I going to need? I, I need resources, right? When you see multiple vehicles, multiple patients, okay? Yeah, I. Uh, we, do we have to worry about contacting ambulances? No. 911 knows they're going to tell CCC, yeah, we have multiple patients. They, they may not have a number, just multiple. So, guess what they're going to do? They're going to dispatch what they have close. They're going to start putting other people on alert, possibly, okay, until we get some information. Because you know what? You might get there and there could be. Yeah, eight patients, seven of them are walking around and, you know what, are a little banged up but don't need an ambulance. And then you've got one that does, and then you've got seven ambulances coming from all over Hell's Half Acre for something that wasn't needed, okay? So, and in our old days, we used to answer the radio directly from the caller. That was the only downfall is that we could get a lot of information off the bat, and everybody heard it. Now it's 911 getting it and transferring it to us. So you just got to think a little bit more uh, when the call comes in, especially if you're taking a lead role, is to say, okay, what am I going to need? Okay. If they say leaking fuel, right? Uh, if there's a traffic incident, single vehicle semi rollover, leaking fuel, okay? What are we thinking about? Colin, anything? Okay, dangerous goods? Leaking fuel? Yeah. Okay, absorbent. Yeah, nixon source. Nixon sources. Hmm? Anyone? What else? Environment. Environment. What else? Fire. Fire suppression. <laughs> okay, you got leaking fuel. Yeah, can you control every every ignition source? No. Okay. Environment. The environment can wait. Okay. But yeah, do we want to make sure that? Right behind rescue is a fire suppression unit. Yeah, we've got leaking fuel, okay? I don't want anybody going in to rescue somebody when I don't have a fire truck ready 
if they're waiting, you know, and if we're sitting here and we got somebody in the hall says, you know, well, rescues, you know, loaded full, um, but tanker two is here, we only have three people and it's got leaking fuel, send them. You know, they've got a full truck and rescue, we can shuffle some stuff, but I need fire suppression, okay? So those, again, those are just little things that you think of, that you'll start thinking of. Okay, next slide. Better hustle here. <laughs> Incident response is determined pre-planning. Again, it's difficult to pre-plan, but you get through this through experience by going to repeated incidents. You can start to you can start seeing stuff. Okay, I don't know if you're like Chris and I, where we start dreaming of incidents in our in our minds, <laughs> how to combat them. <laughs> do you do that, John? Do you dream of incidents at night? I'm waiting for an answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, what are, the, what are our capabilities? I used to dream. Yeah. <laughs> okay, our, pri our prime, uh, primary elements. Okay, what are our capabilities? <coughs> are we capable of handling this situation? Uh, EMS. So yeah, if if dispatch phones and, and when they and they say we have a, a leak of some substance, okay, right off my head, I'm say, I'm thinking dangerous goods. When I get on scene, I am going to want to find out. Okay. Uh, you know, what's, what's my tool that I want to get as soon as I get on scene? Because if command's first and it's a dangerous goods, what tool do I want to have ready? I need a rule of thumb. Huh? A flag? Guidebook. What? My guidebook, right? Okay. Do I have it in command or do I have it on my phone? I got it on my phone. As, as soon as I get on scene, I want, I want to know, you know, and hopefully maybe dispatch has got some information for me ahead of time. Okay, but I want to identify. Maybe it's not a tragic toxic in substance. We can do it. And if it, but if it is, guess what? I want to hold people back, and then I got to start coming up with another plan. Okay, law enforcement, those kinds of things. We've gone to scenes where we've been waiting for the cops to show up, and they weren't even notified by dispatch. Okay, so again, are the police on route, and do we have to call that? Or do we just radio dispatch? Can you phone and make sure RCMP are on route? Okay, just make a quick call. Let, let me know if they're if they're on route. If they're not, okay, get them on route. Next slide. <clears throat> All personnel should be prepared to assume the duties of IC. Okay, I have a little trouble with this slide. Okay, but at some point. Yes, you should be able to take incident command, all right? And there's no one in here that's exempt that if you took out rescue and, I mean, there's been times that, you know what, I've been in the shower and the call comes in, well, it's gonna take me some time to get dry, changed, get out the door, and rescue could be gone, right? You get on scene, do you do anything different than what I would do? You shouldn't, okay? But again, that's training. Is there a difference in some knowledge? Possibly. You know, your years of experience, okay? But ultimately, you got to make decisions, manage resources, know you your response plan, and be prepared mentally and emotionally. That's the IC, the IC circle, okay? You got to make decisions. If your decision is I'm not comfortable putting my team. There might be some hazards that. So yeah. So let's let's say we come up to another a dangerous goods incident. Okay, you're not completely sure. Chris and Mark, myself. Okay, Johnny, you're the you're the officer. You got put in officer of rescue. Okay, and you're not totally comfortable. And you're like, you know what? I gotta wait. I'm gonna play this out. I want to get all my information. Okay, somebody in the car dies as a result of time. Okay, are you liable? You know, it'd be a tough sell to say, you know what, the best interest of my people, and you know what, if I can justify by saying, you know what, uh, I needed to make sure this, this, and this, you know, a good, it would take one hell of a lawyer to try and uh, do you over on that one, okay? As long as your personnel, or, you know, you, that's what you're going for is safety uh, of your personnel. You know what? I didn't have the resources. If you so, if Johnny takes out command, okay, and rescue is 
en route, but it's a long distance away, and somebody dies. While the fire department was on scene, they did absolutely nothing. You know, sorry, Your Honor, but uh, I was in an SUV. I said I had bottled water, and I have an ERG guide. I can't do anything, right? I had information. I was collecting data. But until the truck gets there, you know, there's nothing I can do, right? So you manage the resources you have, right? Yeah, if you've got a full complement of trucks and you don't do anything, yeah, now you know what? You're going to get into some neglect, okay? But again, managing that resource. Know your response plan, okay? Don't jump in the officer's seat, okay? If you don't, if you have no idea, okay, that means you need to do some training. And it's important, especially the this group here, because there's a lot of future officers, when we do training, take that role, take that lead role once in a while, okay? It's, but yeah, the jaws are fun. And you know what, I, Chris and I are no, no different and guilty of it by saying, yeah, you know what, I want, I'd love to use the jaws too, okay? But we have roles to do, and we need, our role is to train people, okay? And be mentally and emotionally prepared. Traffic incident, okay? There's a potential there could be blood. There's a potential there could be death, chaos, all that stuff, okay? But that only comes with time and it comes with confidence, okay? There was a time Chris and I were, ooh, first call is an in an officer seat, right? Oh, first call in command, you know, fluttering heartbeat, okay? And, and all you're doing is like, oh my goodness, do everything right, and we're going to keep everybody safe. And it's like, well, that's the time you should be thinking about the scene. But when you're first doing the role, that's what you're thinking about. Okay? Am I going to keep everybody safe? You know, am I going to hurt somebody? Uh, am I going to make the right decision? Am I uh, driving in the right direction? Yeah, am I, going to, <laughs> am I going in the right direction? Those kinds of things. But now with experience, you know, I know I'm going to keep everybody safe because I've trained everybody else to keep everybody else safe. And am I going to make all the right decisions? I don't know. I know that I'm not going to maliciously and intently make a bad decision. And I, and I have no problem asking other officers, here's what I'd like to do. What do you think? But I'm also, and one thing you'll find when it comes into the emergency management portion of this, okay? Some people look different. You know what? Get on scene. Here's what I want done. Make it happen. This is your job. This is your job. This is your job. Your crews, make it happen for me. Okay? Safety is everyone's responsibility. Yeah, safety is everyone's responsibility. But to give tasks, Sherry, your crew's in charge of traffic. Sit there, Dorsten. 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 Okay? Your job is fire suppression. Chris, your job is disentanglement and uh, extrication. Make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's the command. Yes. Okay? Make it happen. You guys got your crews. Make it happen. So, Chris, when I just give you that, what's your, what's your, what are you thinking of, of now? I've just told you, make extrication happen. Do my plan of attack, how to do it with my crew okay. that I got available? Inner outer circle, do I need tools? Do I need, okay, he's thinking of, you know, he, he's not doing an inner outer circle, he's sending his team. He might be saying, Jordan, you're getting all the tools out ready that we need. Cody, you're doing cribbing. Um, and Jorston might be saying, okay, Jamie, uh, I want you to pull out a foam line, okay? Fire suppression, we're ready to go, okay? Sherry's on traffic. Uh, Colin, uh, your job is to come up with a, you know, how we're going to set up our pylons, okay? There's a curve. Is it always the officer that has to do it? No, if you've got the people that are trained, utilize it because it builds confidence. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, uh, and next one. Okay, uh, don't go back to the next slide, but just some things I want to, okay. Uh, patients, where are they? What's their status, okay? If they're not, if they're not in serious trauma, okay, we don't rush. We got time to set stuff up. But is it good to have somebody in there keeping them calm? Sure. You know what? A traffic accident's a traffic accident. If they're not that, if they're not hurt, let them. You know what? Sit with them, keep them calm, keep them reassured, okay? And take time and make informed decisions. If they if they they need to get out quickly, okay? 
then you make quick decisions. Hopefully they're always the right, hopefully the right ones. Three critical decisions, okay, and know these. I don't know if they're in your book. Okay. Is it safe to attempt a rescue? Okay, these are three critical decisions that are in the standard. Is it safe to attempt a rescue? Is it a recovery? And do I have sufficient resources? Those are three critical decisions, okay, that will base everything from your, I don't think it's on, it's not on here, it's just labeled. Okay, is it safe to attempt a rescue? Okay, that's a guiding principle. Is it a recovery or is it a rescue? Okay, if it's a recovery, okay, we completely slow down, we slow everything down, right? So the incident at the uh, traffic lights with a guy going 165K, okay, get a, on traffic incident, nobody said anything different than dispatch, pull up, okay, do a quick assessment, okay, yes, it's deceased, okay, now, am I in a panic mode? No, I've got other things to worry about, right? Scene control, okay, those kinds of things, but we're not worried about any disentanglement or anything like that, okay? And do I have sufficient resources, okay? Do I need a whole bunch of super trained people for that call? Or do I just need bodies to protect and keep people away? That's ultimately what we were. We were all traffic control, okay? Scene control until RCMP did their job, okay? So size up begins prior to arrival, dispatch info, pre-fire pre-planning experience, okay? So your first priority is scene assessment. Second is vehicle equipment assessment, then a patient assessment. So the scene assessment, what am I dealing with? This is on page 38 and 39. What's the weather? What's the day of the week? What's the traffic? Uh, pedestrians, number of vehicles involved, okay? Are there apparent hazards? That's your scene assessment. So know those, know those points, those bullets on page 39, okay? The weather. If it's the most gorgeous day you could pick, great. If it's blistering hot, okay, you want to start thinking, even as just a unit officer, you want to think to yourself, hey, do I need these guys in their full bunker gear? Can I get coats off? Okay, so they're not sweating to death. If it's freezing cold, blowing wind and blizzard, okay, they still have to do their job. You hope that they're gonna have their equipment on to keep themselves warm, okay, that's Mother Nature's uh, Darwin selection, okay. But you wanna start rotating, you wanna start thinking of a plan to rotate people out, okay. You don't want that person calling on the radio and saying, you know, is there someone to relieve me because I'm freezing? As an officer, that should be in your forethought already. Is how you know how am I going to replace these guys? Checking checking in on them. Okay. Uh, vehicle equipment assessment. Position, stability, condition. These are on page forty-one. Okay. What's the position of the vehicle? Is it upright on its side? Uh, on its roof. Okay. Is it stable? If it's not stable, that's do we do an assessment on patients if the vehicle's not stable? We could do some not a thorough, not a thorough, not a thorough assessment, but you could certainly try to talk to a patient, okay, and try to get, to, and that'd be an EMS or someone gathering information. But far too often we've seen people, and unfortunately, it's usually EMS that get the scenes first that start crawling on top of vehicles because what are they programmed to do? Help. To help, okay. So that's our CMP when they're first on the scene, right? We, uh, you know, we've always we've heard about uh, our our you know, police officers being severely hurt because they 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 get called to or they come up upon a scene or they're called to a scene. The fire and EMS are on their way. They walk up and I mean everybody I'm sure saw the video right where the police officer gets electric, electrocuted because he went to help somebody and that's. Are they programmed to think about that? Not as much as we are, right? When we go to house fires, right? We, are we programmed to think about, oh geez, there might be 
someone that's a neighbor that has purposely lit the fire, right? As firefighters, do you think about that? Like the hazards outside of the house? Like, oh, is there somebody here that is that purposely lit the fire and wants to kill firefighters? Does anybody, does that go through anyone's mind? Not serious. Hmm? Not regular firefighters. No, it shouldn't. But as an incident commander, when you pull up on a scene, those are things that go through your head is, hey, what started this fire? Like, it's going pretty fast, pretty hard, right? But that comes with time and experience to say, okay, I pull up here, ooh, this is, this is not a normal house fire. And how many people can, how many people in this room could say that, you know, I can predict that that was a, that's not a normal house fire. It takes a lot of experience and I'm, we don't even get enough of them but you watch enough videos and you do enough training things, you can say, hey, you know what, that doesn't look right to me. And back hairs start, you know, standing up, right? You got some spider senses, all right, you know, uh, these are things I want to start thinking about, right? Looking at neighborhoods, all those kinds of things, okay? Uh, so the condition, was it a front impact, rear end, side impact? Uh, Extrication assessment. Okay, so the next step in the process is sizing up your your extrication. Again, we want to be the most effective, right? We want to do it safely and quickly extricate the trapped victim. Sorry, Phil. Mm -hmm. Actually, before that's the assessment of the patient zone forty-two. Oh. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, patient assessment. Okay. Again. I didn't want to talk too much about this because who generally assesses patients EMS. in our world? EMS. Okay, but if we are, uh, if we are, this is our job. Okay, you know the ABCs, right? Airway, breathing, circulation. Are they conscious? You know, can they talk? What? You know, where's their pain? What happened? Mechanism of injury. Those are kind of the things that we want to know. We are not transporting, but that's good information that you can pass on to EMS when they arrive on scene. Are they going to ask very similar questions? Absolutely, unless they trust you wholeheartedly that you've got all the right information, okay? They, they may not do, but would you guys do that? Would you just redo all the exact questions? You probably just program Yeah, them. everybody's got their system they like. So yeah. They okay, so again, we just heard you gave a system, right? This is how they do things, right? Just because of, and we've been on scenes and I've seen paramedics that were off duty and you know what, and start rambling stuff off to me and saying, this is what you gotta do. I'm like, hang on, Trigger. You know what? I understand you're a paramedic. You know what? <laughs> trigger, that was good. <laughs> but you know what? And I mean, and I've come across incidents as well, okay? I address myself that, you know, uh, I, I'm a firefighter and I'm an EMR, okay? But when Strathcona pulls up, I don't, I don't tell them, you know what, boys, I got this in, all in the control, right? Okay, but there's people out there that are like that, okay? But remember, you still got your system, that you still got, this is how you do it. Um, so extrication assessment. <clears throat> are the flammable toxic materials leaking or spilled? Uh, are the windows intact? Do they have to be removed? Okay, when we gotta remove glass, what does that entail? A saw and glass dust, okay? What do patients not like on them? Glass dust, okay? What do firemen not like all over their gear? Glass dust, sucks, okay? So again, do, do, we, are we, have, do we have the patient covered, right? Do we have the goggles, safety glasses, all those kinds of things. Um, do, the, do the vehicle's doors need to be forced to remove? Or can we go to the passenger door and and have the person just lay down? Maybe there's a big, huge console in the way. Hey, that ain't gonna work. But if they're in a bench seat, why would you pull the door off all that energy when you can go around the other side, open the door, slide a spy board, have them lay down, and pull them out? Bang, done. What right? Hmm? What fun is that? Yeah, what fun is that? <laughs> so that's the same thing, right? Go to a house fire, okay? Do we go and smash every window? Yeah, that's because that, you know, that's what you see, but that's not the right way, right? We we learned just doing our little demo a few weeks ago. Okay? Yeah, yeah, the guy that threw the, <laughs> yeah, the guy that threw the, you know, open all the windows and we get the smoke out. So we had a, a, a rookie firefighter, well, he wasn't even a rookie. He threw, uh, 
$500 office chair through a brand new $1,000 bay window because he couldn't figure out how to open it. So he just decided to throw an office chair up to Van Valleys. Needless to say, the owner that had very minimal damage in the basement from fire and smoke is now replacing a $1,000 window and getting a new office chair. So, uh, next slide. So what is needed to safely and ex quickly extricate trapped victims? Uh, the resources, it's a continuous process. So we're talking about resource assessment. What do we need? What do we have? If we don't need something on scene now, get rid of it. You know what? We have generally, we have far too often we get scenes and they just get cluttered with too much stuff. Get stuff out, okay? Have the stuff there that you need. Patient, patient uh, removal assessment. Is it just a normal or is it rapid? Okay? Big differences. If it's just a normal extrication, take your time, assess the situation, build your plan, gather your data, okay? Get the patient out. Rapid extrication. If a paramedic says this person's life depends on him getting out in the next five minutes, is that doable? You betcha. We got the tools, the techniques, the trades, the skill. We can cut open a car in five minutes. It ain't going to be pretty, okay? It's not going to be, you know, the, the nicest looking extrication. We're going to get them out, okay? And we've done it, okay? Is there, now all of a sudden, is there some inherent risks for firefighters? Yeah, rapid extrication. You know what? Run up and get me this. Run up and get me that, okay? <laughs> Cutting this. Tools are being dropped here and there. This is what we do. There's an inherent risk, but again, if you're well trained, confident, and competent, does that start to, you know, like you just know where to put stuff, okay? We've been on codes where EMS bags all over the place, and they're just reaching and grabbing stuff and popping stuff, and there's stuff all over the place. It's not what I do normally, and it's like, you know, how do you keep track of, like, how do you know that, you know, reaching in that pocket, there's that thing you need when, you know, they're like, well, can you go get us this? For my tour that that was in cupboard number six, right? But yeah, they, again, knowing your trucks, where our stuff. How many times have we been in incidents where we say, you know what, Brendan, go get me this, and then you've got a fireman that's opening up. Yeah, and it's always the last one. Okay, and that's that's a part of knowledge and skill. Okay, outside assistance, what do we need? I'm looking at some of these structural or mechanical engineers. Okay, I'm not sure at a vehicle incident, but yeah, if it's in a building, sure. Chemists or hazardous material specialists, railroad officials, farmers and agricultural extension agents. Okay, why on earth would you want to call an agricultural person to a, a vehicle incident? That was involving agricultural stuff? Sure. Yes. I say, I am not a chicken pro or a pork pro. I'm very well at eating them, but not well at gathering them. Okay? There are people that, you know, there are people to do that. What am I doing for time here? Ooh, got one minute left. John states farm vehicle extrication, specialized tools, assistance, and stabilization. The what? You just say about uh, like farm vehicle extrication. Why, why would you think? Because that's why agricultural agents maybe because you know that's right. If they do cover agricultural distribution, cutting a cutting yeah. a combine apart, you might need some experience. Yeah, uh, even just yeah, even just putting a combine fire out. Okay, uh, somebody who knows the combine or yeah, how it works. Farmers are great for that. They're great for that, right? You know, a farm mechanic, an agricultural mechanic who knows that thing inside and out. I've never been inside of a combine, okay? I've driven, driven them around for, you know, once in a while back in the past, but I've never been inside of all these new ones now. Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, cop, the, the cop had no, uh, no evidence. So. Uh, okay, page 45 and 44 and 45, next slide. Forty-five minutes. I'm going to get through this quick. 
Go three more slides, John. One more. Okay, we're going to go through incident management here. Okay, incident command okay, equals organize, organization. That's what incident command's job is. Okay, is keep the situation organized. And that's through decision making, that's through strategizing, it's through gather, gathering information. Do you have to do all of that? No. Okay. Can I can I can I get someone to gather data for me and bring it back? Absolutely. Do I have to make all the decisions? No. Yeah. You know what? If I if I put uh, Tony as my rescue captain, who's very familiar with vehicles, you know what? Tony, you know what? Tell me what's the best. What do you think the best way is to do that extrication? You know, he tells me. Yeah, you know what? I'm good with that. Okay. You you can't do it all, and you and again for them for the potential officers in here. Remember, you're looking at your truck. Okay, but you still got to start looking at the big picture and how you involve yourself in that situation. Incident command. So we we've, we've, everybody's done the ICS 100, right? Okay. It follows steps. It follows procedures. Okay. Everything falls on incident command. True. Okay. But do you utilize what you have? Okay. To make your job easier. The worst thing you can do as an incident commander is take everything on your shoulders and make everything your your business. Okay. You will fail. I don't care who you are. You may think you're the best, and that's just this is my philosophy. You will fail if you put everything on your shoulders, right? Delegate stuff down. That's why you have the trained people trust in them, okay? And I've seen in the past, I've seen uh, people that don't trust, okay? And everything is going to be my decision, you know what? But yet, I've got people that know exactly what they're doing, you know what? And they've made, and you know what? They've given me an idea. I take that. Okay, it's just less thinking for me to do, but I say it comes down to uh, a lot of trust. Uh, so, does your situation management change with responders? You mean like you does your, the management? So, your incident command. Does your situation management change with your responders? Yes. Absolutely. Right. So again, dictating who's on trucks, okay? Sometimes, you know what, that's the shitty call to make, right? Yeah, you know what, I know this is a confirmed structure fire. We have someone trapped, okay? I will phone back to the hall if I'm on route, and I will say, you know what, these people better be on that truck, okay? Why? Because where's all the liability falling? On me, so you know what? I want the right people. Okay. Uh, you know, oh, it's a fire alarm. You know, at Heritage House. You know what? Let's send one one senior. Let's get three rookies on there. If it's smoke, you know what? We'll pack another truck up. But we're going off what we. But it's giving some people some time with the lights and sirens. Okay, and going to a call, getting rid of that emotion, uh, emotional uh, that need the need <laughs> okay so you have to get that out of your system and it just comes with time okay um uh let's mention here uh we have to ensure the safety of the members and experience can leap in oh who said that uh that was john yeah okay put the wrong people on a truck okay just because you want to give some time again uh, uh, in a serious incident, okay, where we can't be a babysitting service, officers can't, you know, they have to know that people can follow instructions, okay? You got freelancers, those are the first ones you start cutting off at the knees and stopping them and saying, you know what, I'll put you here, okay, and, tell, and we've seen it, we've seen freelancers over the years, okay, and they can put people in, in, in a dangerous situation, and normally they put their crew and back, you know, and up the ladder in a, in a bad predicament. So that's a good point. Uh, next slide. 
The incident command systems help guide many decisions. So establishing command, usually the first senior person on scene, whoever's in the officer's chair in that first truck, generally is the one that takes initial command. All right, and then as more people come, they start taking taking over. Okay, uh, whether it's a command unit, whether it's another higher level officer, and. Uh, So as, can an incident be ran without a command unit? Yes. yes, absolutely, okay. First arriving rescuer, okay, they generally, that if there wasn't an incident, like it wasn't a command unit in a vehicle situation, it's your first arriving rescuers that are gonna make, they're gonna make the calls, they're gonna do the assessments, exactly what command is doing, right? Just without an SUV. Unified command, okay. Do we use unified command to some extent? Yeah. A lot on vehicle rescues, right? We go to a house fire. RCMP usually do not get involved in our business. What is it you need from us, right? We get to vehicle incidents. You know what? We're both needed there, okay? Are, we, are RCMP needed at a house fire? No. They're good to have because that keeps your crowd control, okay? Because nothing brings a community together like a good house fire, right? So yeah, they're good to have, all right? Their eyes, they're not getting involved in a situation. They're looking around, okay? They're like, oh, you know what? Why, why, why is that kid standing there watching, right? Oh, you know what? I saw this person at the last house fire. Those are things that our CMP do. We're not usually programmed because we're dealing with a fire. But on a vehicle incident, yeah, unified command. You do this, I'll do this, okay? Your people do this, we'll do this, okay? Working together. That comes with good relationships. Good relationships are built on trust, okay, honesty between the, the between the, the services. And believe me, it can be broken as fast as it can be uh, as it can be built. Is there was a time in this in this community that there was no harmony whatsoever between uh, this building and the one downtown, and to a point where there were police officers parked around here on training nights, just to stop every vehicle and see if someone had had a drink. And, you know, again, but that was, there was, you know, they were, it took a while to build some trust up with, you know, with the next staff, but that's, you know, those kind of things happen. Does that put a damper on what happens out at scenes? Absolutely. Yeah, you know what, if you got no, no relationship between the two, and an officer tells you, can you go in that, that bloody dirty car and give me the insurance. You know what? I don't need it. You do. You will get it. Okay? Again, you don't want that, but that does happen. We have a great relationship with our RCMP and EMS right now. Okay? I like to keep it like that. Next slide. Okay, let's take a, a break and then we'll just do objective seven and then we'll do chapter three when we get back. 8.30, Yeah, we'll go till 10 tonight. We'll get these chapters done. We may have to look at moving on. Right now. We don't see any of that because it's just too easy. Mm -hmm. So maybe the next one might be like sitting here looking at that yourself. Oh, if I had the, if I had a bigger, longer cord, they probably. Had well, honestly, you could probably, originally had it over there. I haven't. By the time the plug in like that four, yeah. I've said that four hours. Oh, really? Oh. But you can change that. So we can pull a cord over. We can pull a cord over here for the extension cord. What? I'll just leave it for this. I'll, I'll put it over. In the extension cord, you can do it. Mm -hmm. I know the guys are saying that uh, sounds good. Okay. Um, yeah, a couple of shots at you while you're uh,
You're still better than Colin. So. <laughs> yeah, Colin's just like. <laughs> 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 Marshall is like, what the fuck are they doing over there? Just because one of them had the same look at my face. What the fuck are they doing? There's gotta be a better picture. For who? Caller. Next time, maybe what we'll do is he can control the slides because he's right beside me here. If that helps, yeah. Figure what John wants was to do it. Like, this, uh, this ABG thing is pissing me off. Yeah, you, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I just know it just says it's a threat. But I moved it to the side. Keeps, I moved it to the side to get yeah. off the screen so it still shows it. I think that's what uh, killed me. Okay, we'll get out of here. All right. Okay. You want my Is everyone to 10? I got a power. Let's leave. You want to go to 10? Okay, so objective seven uh, key components of an extrication operation. So this is between 47 and 60. It's a, a fair sized, uh, fair sized, uh, not a chapter, but a component. Okay. So command and control. Okay, we've beaten command to death probably. Uh, available resources. Uh, scene control, vehicle stabilization, patient access, disentanglement, treatment, extrication, triage, transport, shelter, uh, shelter of patients. So these are all things uh, from command that you need to take, to take into consideration. Okay, how are we going to control our scene, right? Vehicle stabilization, stable, stabilization. We don't have to do any, we, you're not responsible, or you don't have to do all these tasks, you're also responsible for it as part of your plan, okay? But vehicle stabilization. Once it's stabilized, can stabilization change? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So someone needs to be continuously monitoring it, okay? Uh, patient access. Sending one or two people, have a look around. What's the best way to get this person out, okay? Once the patient's out, okay? The stabilization stuff and the, the, the patient access, okay? That's taken care of now, right? Now we're, now we're looking at uh, maintaining scene control. We're talking about looking at environment, okay? Generally, EMS is gonna worry about treatment, all right? And triage, transport, okay? Shelter of patients. Uh, if all the glass is broken, okay, and it's freezing cold, okay, you've got a patient that has got some trauma. The last thing they need is uh, freezing cold weather, right? So maybe we want to we want to cover them up, shelter them. Uh, same with our rescuers, right? Constantly rotating people out depending on the weather situation. Look, he got Yeah, he goes. Small incidents versus large incidents, okay? Uh, where should command be, right? If it's a little small incident, okay, command can be there. If it's a large incident, command shouldn't be there. It should be away, right? Because what's command's job? To look at the big picture, right? right? So if it's a large incident and you're in the middle of it, you can't see it. You can't see the whole situation. Again, that comes with experience, knowledge, right? where you want to be. Being away from the situation as an incident commander, what does that give you? Perspective? What do? What does it not make you do? This is the video. Micromanage. Micromanage, get involved. Because believe it or not, even incident commanders, okay? Yeah, oh, you know what? Uh, 
Collins holding that tool wrong. Oh, just uh, I'm going to go in there, right? No. Okay, you rely on everybody else. I'm not picking on you, Paul. Thomas Collins. Okay, but you want to be able to see this. You want to be able to see the scene. You want to be able to manage the scene. You don't want to be too far away that you can't get information. You want to be close enough that people can get in contact with you, okay? And you can see what's going on. Uh, next slide. Every incident operation group will have a supervisor, right? Who are our supervisors? Officers. Truck officers, right? So if you got an extrication crew, hey, there's a supervisor. It's usually the truck officer, all right? Uh, so if you've got a captain in uh, in the uh, officer's seat of rescue, and you've got a lieutenant who is on uh, on the tools, okay? Could that lieutenant be a supervisor? Could anyone here with this course and competent be a supervisor? Yeah. Sure. Doesn't have to be the truck officer. Of course, they're all to be responsible for that truck, but to say, you know what, supervise that? Sure, go right ahead, okay? It could be having someone who's trained and very competent in vehicle extrication you know what? I'll be the one that runs back and forth and gets the tools while I've got a couple of new people who are, are trained, okay, and just need some more experience. I'm going to watch them, you know, and I'm going to let them do it. And unfortunately, in our system, quite often that gets neglected where we give people the opportunities. So uh, as you move up in ranks, just remember, you, we're going to give you a chance to move up in the ranks. Make sure you let other people move up and you know try things. That's how you're going to learn, especially in training. Okay, uh, if you know what you're doing in training, let the person you know what teach the other the other person. That's not to and just because you have this course again, it comes down to confidence and knowledge. Okay, that's a, a huge thing in the fire service. Right, EMS same thing. Right, go through the course. Okay, is every IV the same? Never, right? So you only get it by doing it under pressure or doing it through training, okay? Letting people take part in these things. Uh, following the chain of command, okay? Can you go to the next slide, John? Yeah. Okay, so the medical group, transportation group, extrication group, we have a fire group in there, okay? Uh, so extrication and medical are generally Fire and part EMS and medical and transportation is generally part fire and, and EMS. Okay, so I kind of had this little here. Okay, this is fire, that's EMS, right? You didn't, you won't be able to see that on the webcam. Oh, there he's doing it for you. Ah, good man, John. Okay, so firemen don't transport, okay, and EMS don't extricate. But we're all part of the whole team together, okay? We rely on EMS for some knowledge about their injuries and how we should move them, okay? And can firemen, can firemen drive ambulances with the right license? Absolutely. And what does that give? An extra set of eyes and hands in the back for treatment, right? So we're all a part of it, but... Uh, next, next slide. After you went through all that work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, John. Uh, weather extremes pose a risk to both rescuers and patients. So, okay, we've beaten this to death too, okay? But that's everybody's job to make sure that we're recognizing that if you're cold, say something to your officer, okay? If you're sweating to death, say something to your officer. If you need a break, say something, okay? Don't, don't think that the officers, you know, have everything, you know, at the tip of their tongues or, you know, on the, on the tip of their brains that this is what we have to do, okay? We should, but we learn that, okay? But if there's, you know, if you need a break, say you need a break, okay? Far too often we've seen people, no, I'm going to push through this, push through this, then all of a sudden you've got somebody standing with a slow paddle and ready to do a nose plant on asphalt, okay? You know, if uh, any diabetics in the room? And then this one, okay? We've had that before. Oh, I'm diabetic. I forgot to tell you. You know, all you needed was, you know, a bottle of cold water and maybe a, a little snack and it had been fine. 
But again, we need to know these things, right? And protecting patients, uh, keeping them covered up, uh, not just from weather elements, but all the elements of our extrication, right? Uh, has anybody ever been in a vehicle as a patient, like a true patient, when you're being extricated by the fire service? Hey, okay? it ain't pretty. It doesn't sound good. Okay, you hear crunching behind you, and because this is what this is all you feel. You've got this massive mammoth hands holding your head like this, covering your ears, and because that's what they're told to do, and all you hear is. Okay, it's frightening. It's not as bad for us because we know, kind of know what's going on, okay? But I was in an accident when I was younger, before I got into this, and yeah, it's, it's pretty threatening, okay? And I've heard it from other people, it's scary. We know what we're doing, okay? That's why it's constant reassuring. Okay, you know what? All they're doing is they're, they're cutting the post so that we can open the door for you, okay? Just reassuring them that, you know, you know, and you're sitting there, and all of a sudden you can feel like the cutters, you know, near you. Okay, that's that's freaky to somebody. Okay, so we just have to remember about protecting them, not just from the weather. One thing John just brought up here is that he said some firefighters, for example, one of our ex members, uh, carried an EpiPen with them, and he always informed people of it throughout the mm -hmm. Yeah, he always had an EpiPen with them just in case he's definitely definitely allergic to wasps. Yeah, so. Yeah, and you know the next thing you know, yeah, you're doing a, you know, you're you're doing a uh, an agricultural fire, and wasps all over the place, right? So we need to, you know, we, we knew that, right? We knew that. Traffic control, yeah, you know, hot day, you know, and there's wasps around you, right? He was like definitely afraid and, and scared of wasps, but like he had he had seconds before he gets his epipen. So again, good good point. Uh, next slide. Okay, apparatus placement, okay, can reduce risks during extrication. This is very critical when you're in the incident command role, okay. The last thing you want to do, and even if you're first on scene, not that I'm going to pick on you guys again, EMS are the worst for this, okay. Okay. <laughs> He didn't say you specifically call it. No, he he did did call it. it. <laughs> but where, where do EMS want to be? Right there. Front and center. Not in the action. They want to be close to the patient as possible, right? The less, they got a lot of stuff to carry. Circle right by the, the smoking vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> okay? They want to be near the patient. They got a lot of stuff to carry. Okay? If you don't know how big your patient is or, you know, so the closer you are, the better. Okay? And you know what? I'm a firm believer in that too. Okay, but we only have so much cord on our rescue unit. So if we end up having to park a hundred feet back, uh, nothing is worse than getting to the car and you're two feet too short. Okay, now we're taking time to to move uh, to move apparatus, and nothing I think looks worse than a bunch of services rearranging their apparatus when the general motor in public is going by. Okay, because you got to stop traffic move stuff around okay it's no different in a house fire okay parking in the the appropriate place okay the shadow vehicle so rescue i wouldn't use as a shadow vehicle in the extrication okay that's why we always take a tanker with us okay if somebody doesn't want to pay attention and slam into a tanker truck you know what have at her okay as long as my people are safe that's why we always put him at an angle, okay? Why do we put him at an angle? What's that? More reflection. Yeah, deflection, right? They're bigger. Hopefully we can look at from that angle. Yes, plus you see you see bigger, more of a truck. You don't get the same amount of light effect, okay? But yeah, you see a bigger unit, okay? Hopefully that you know, deters people, okay? But uh, your rescue unit, hey, that's your lifeblood. That's your bread and butter for an extrication scene. The last thing you want is that thing getting hit, okay? Uh, giving enough distance so that you're still workable, okay? Uh, I mean, and this is only something we started doing, what, maybe four or five years ago? What's that? Doing our vehicles at an angle? But, yeah, it's recent. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. recent. Because yeah. until then, you were always like, you know what, we got these big chevrons on the back, we want people to see them. Okay, turn it at an angle, 
when you turn vehicles at an angle, so you look at this picture, okay? What's it, how's that truck parked? How many lanes is he in? How many lanes is he in? Three lanes. What's the law in Alberta for passing an emergency vehicle? You need one full lane between you to maintain that posted speed limit. Okay? You ever see a police officer that parks in the lane and you know puts one wheel in the in the driving lane and the rest is in the shoulder? Okay? On a four on a divided highway, cop does that, pulls you over, and he's in this, he's got his tires in this lane, and he's in the shoulder, you're passing in this lane. What's the speed limit you have to go? Sixty. Sixty, because he's in that lane. If he's entirely on the shoulder, by law, how fast can you go posted? You can go to the posted speed limit. Okay? Has he put himself a lot in danger by putting one wheel? Not really. Okay? As opposed to taking up the whole lane. But we take that. Now, do our cars gonna go sailing by in that in that in this kind of situation? No, because they're all stopping to see what the hell happened. Yeah. Well, some are. Well, yeah, Cody's on traffic. Yeah, let's go. He's on traffic. Poor code. That was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But most people are worried about who? Themselves. Themselves. Okay. So if you put your vehicles in a position to make them make their, their own decision, those big trucks, you know what? If you give them enough room, you know what? That they can go fast, they'll go fast. Cut off a bit of their room, and they have to go into the shoulder. Will they be mad going by you? Yeah. yeah, go right ahead. You know what? I know they're going 50, okay? Because they're not putting their big rig in the ditch off the shoulder, okay? And that was what we had with Cody's incident. You know, we had we had moved pylons over, and all of a sudden we had this wider lane. You know what? So we learned to push the pylons over. You know what? They see that. They know now, okay, well, why are they doing that? But I'm not going to take out a bunch of pylons, okay? So again, that's part of this apparatus, apparatus and placement. It's important as the officer or the incident command to try and get them put into position right the first time, okay? Uh, next slide. I'm not gonna go into this too much. Traffic control, okay? Lots of different devices. We've got the big pink sign. We've got traffic, traffic uh, control uh, people, pylons, okay? <coughs> lights, flares, all those kinds of things. Channeling devices, so we're using the pylons to channel people, okay? They're only effective if they're done right, okay? So uh, what's the golden rule for setting out pylons for traffic when you're doing a, a diminishing lane? What's the, what's our? 10 steps, and then okay. one step. 10 steps, one over, put a pylon. 10 steps, one pylon, okay? Generally from a far distance, when you're driving, it should look like a wall at nighttime. Okay, that gives people's attention that there's a wall in front of me of, of, of orange and, and, bright, and bright tape, okay? What we want them to do is slow down so that they can make an informed decision as to where they want to go, okay? And that's something that we can do far in advance, okay? When they're in the lane, okay, emergency sign ahead, okay? If you don't put something up and they can't see the lights, all right? It could be just when people think, oh, you know, the highway guys left their pylons up because they did chip steel. And they're flying through, right? Okay, next one. Did I miss this slide on there? Okay, next one. Okay, we just talked about that. Flaggers where, okay? Golden rule, always keep yourself in escape route, facing traffic, okay, 45 degree, so you can see what's happening here, but you can see what's coming down the road. Never turning your back, always have yourself in escape route, so make sure it's a clean, open ditch. If you're by, okay, flagging by a bridge is not a wise idea, okay? So think about your own safety. If you had to escape, how can you escape? Okay, we talked about channeling devices, position, minimum number, again, if you're covering, if you want to channel somebody from a lane, it should go from the shoulder into the next next lane. It should cover the entire lane. Okay. If those pylons are over one, 
If you give people a full lane, people think I've got a full lane. You know what? For the safety of everybody, take a bit of their lane away and make them slow down. Okay, next slide. And the next one. Okay, control zones. Hot, warm, cold. Where, did, where have we seen this before? Hazmat. In hazmat, right? Is it any different with structure fires? No. We have a hot zone, we have a warm zone, we have a cold zone, okay? What happens in the hot zone? That's where, the, that's where the shit's happening, right? Okay, that's the incident. Warm zone, okay, we want limited access of people in there. Okay, so when we're doing the hot, the restricted zone, okay, that's our inner circle. That should be within a few, you know, maybe five, five feet around the vehicle doing the inner circle. That person is getting a glimpse of how many patients, what do we need, what was the impact. You're getting some information, okay? On the outside of the hot zone, all right, and into the warm zone, hey, what are we looking for when we do that circle? Equipment. Hey, the, where, the, where, working equipment the working equipment. Where can we put equipment? Hey, what other hazards are there, right? Is there a train track? Is there uh, power lines? Uh, is there somebody ejected from the vehicle? Okay, there's nothing worse than getting to a vehicle seeing a lot of damage and there's a person in the driver's seat, and it's like, and they're, you know, they're saying, well, you know, how's my buddy? <laughs> Who? You know? And all of a sudden, you go for a walk, and there he is, you know, 30, 40 feet, he's been ejected from the vehicle, okay? So, again, how do we look for those things? Tracks, okay? Some people have got out of, you know, got out of vehicles, and they just crawled. We had that at 631 and 16, where the with the truck with the with the truck in the trailer, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, he he walked off. He was just disoriented from from rolling, flipping it, and he got out. He was he self extricated, but then went for a walk, and yeah, buddy was his buddy's in the truck, still trapped, and you know he's gone for a walkabout, but he collapsed. It's like. You know, so when you do your inner circle, when you do your circles, okay, and for EMS as well too, when you guys get on scene, okay, if you notice, you know, tracks in in fresh grass, okay, that's a. I don't expect you guys to do that, but you know, when we get on scene, you know, that looks kind of weird. Okay, well we'll go have a look, right? Unless there's like you know two three ambulances that you know fill your boots. And then the cold zone, okay, that's where we want. That's our safety zone, okay. We want people in there, uh, and and this is all to just to create congestion. You don't want everything too close. Now, are they all perfect circles? No. Okay. In a perfect world, yes, but no. Uh, next slide. Procedures for evacuation routes and pre-planning. Again. What's the what's our emergency code? <coughs> emergency, 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 right? That gets everybody's attention on the radio. Okay, if we're in a close confines of uh, of a vehicle rescue, can an officer simply say, "Heads up"? Okay, you can do that. All right, especially if a traffic control person says there's a wild car. You know, they're the ones that are going to be emergency, emergency, emergency. You know, as a wild car coming coming through, right? If you're right there, you know what? Broadcast it out to everybody via voice, okay? The quickest means. Huh? Yeah, it does happen very quick, okay? Uh, so when you're on a scene, how do you, you know, where can you protect yourself? How many people think about that when you're asked to go cut open, you know, you're, you're been tasked to do a, a roof removal on a car? So your team sitting there, you're doing that, okay? What's your escape route, okay? How many people think about that? Probably not a lot, because you're expecting somebody else to do that, right? Can we control every vehicle that comes down the road? No, somebody might veer off, you know, falling asleep, miss all our vehicles, come right through the ditch and slam in. <clears throat> Is it possible? Yeah. Has it happened before? Yes. You know, we've heard about it. We've never encountered it, but again, uh, okay. Well, next slide, and the next one. 
We'll go to the picture with the car. Next one. All right. There are many hazards to recognize and control on scene. Okay. Airbags, because we're getting into the airbag section now. Okay. <clears throat> airbags have an inherent danger to all first responders. Okay. Marshall's done a lot of uh, research on this, and on Thursday he's going <clears> to <throat> he's going to talk a little bit about airbags. Okay. Uh, in 2007, all vehicle manufacturers, I believe, changed where you don't. So you need three things: you need acceler, you need speed, you need deceleration, and you need impact for an airbag to go off. Huh? For airbag to go off. Airbag to go off. Because we've always been programmed to cut battery cables. Okay, if a vehicle sitting there, okay. It, there's a 99.9% .9 chance it will not go off because it doesn't meet the three criteria. Okay? There has to be some kind of an acceleration. So we were always under the assumption that if we ever bumped a car, that you know the airbags would go off. Okay, the new generation. And is that right, Cody? Like, I mean, do you do you because you keep dropping these things in my office? <laughs> Gary just said on newer vehicles only. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Marshall said it was 2007 and newer. Okay. Beyond that. The, the vehicles, yes, there's uh, the sensors. Uh, it, it didn't need it didn't need deceleration. So now the sensors the sensors will detect uh, there's a certain speed, a rapid deceleration, and there has to be impact. Those three things for the airbags to deploy. Okay. Um, So we are on page 61. All right, so next slide. So extrication is performed after all hazards are mitigated. Okay. Can we say that with 100% accuracy? No. Can hazards continually... Yeah. Okay, we have to we have to constantly be checking for them, right? Is there a possibility that uh, a fuel uh, we can get a fuel leak, you know, after we've done our initial check? Yeah, yeah for sure. Okay, so uh, patient considerations. Uh, and I, I didn't do my note on this. So we want to take it. We want to figure out what the uh, what the patient status is for okay, before we start uh, doing our extrication. Okay, what thinking about them? Okay, do we need to cover them uh, again? Is it rapid? Is it a normal extrication? Coming up with the extrication plan. Again, we talked about efficiency and effectively all, all, all evening. Right. Let's do what's required don't over don't overkill right stabilize the vehicle so we got our plan stabilize the vehicle once it's stabilized we know that we're going to be able to uh, get access to this okay and then uh do we have access to the vehicle uh is it is it always on a perfect you know nice dry pavement or can it be in a ditch full of water can it be in a ditch a field full of snow okay how do you get access to that? All right. Uh, disentangle the patients. Okay. So pull the vehicle away from, from try to get the vehicle away from the patient. Okay. Don't try to take the patient out of the car. Think about it that way. We're going to remove the car from the patient. Okay. So we got some access <clears throat> and then package them up. Okay. Again, we package them up with consultation with EMS. Okay. Uh, what's you know what do we need to look at? What do we need to take care of? Right, uh, nothing's worse than trying to extricate somebody who's got a badly broken leg or a broken knee, and you're trying to twist them out, okay, and putting them in massive amounts of pain. That's where a paramedic comes in handy, and something called morphine, I think it is. Or it's happened, you know. I mean, if if they can give some drugs to kill massive amounts of pain. Rather than spending 20 minutes trying to remove a steering wheel, 
So you know what? It might be you know what? Let's kill the pain. It's a quick couple of second pull, okay? And then and then they're free, right? So again, are we working as a team? Yeah, because they got something that they got something that we need, okay? And we're going to say we have something we can save them time, right? And they because they want to get them in the ambulance and off to the hospital. Next one. Okay, terminating the incident. Okay, follows the specific process. Once everybody's extricated, okay, released and transported, okay, if an ambulance is still on scene, okay, and they're doing their stuff in the back, which they quite often do, okay, we don't just pack everything up and leave, okay? okay we're there, again, for scene safety, so we don't want somebody smashing into the back of an ambulance. Restoring the scene back to normal, that means getting the traffic uh, back flowing, okay? And one thing that we've really started being proactive with lately on highway scenes is when we're tearing down traffic, tearing it down very systematically. There was a time when we just said, okay guys, pack her up, let's go. So you had people all over the highway packing up pylons, okay? And there was still that potential that a rogue vehicle not paying attention could come and, you know, and take out one of your crew members, okay? Just so you guys know, I see a lot of people writing some heavy notes. You guys can download this off the uh, off your program, the email, so you can get you can download uh, print print this off. I think that's right, isn't it, John? Give me a a yes. Yeah, they were on there earlier. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So you can. I think you can get them. Yeah. John says yes. Okay. Picking up and cleaning up. All right. Making sure we're picking stuff up. Okay. EMS when they take off with their patient. Okay. They don't start picking up all their little items, okay? Their primary concern is getting that patient to medical attention, okay? We don't want to leave needles or any products, biohazards, sitting in the ditch for somebody to pick up, okay? So again, scene cleanup. Uh, if it requires mitigation for environment, again, it's either up to us or it's up to the RCMP, but we work as a team and we make some phone calls and, and get that happening. A restore traffic flow, okay? Ultimately, the traffic incident, okay? That's what we want is to restore traffic flow, right? Get everybody back to the, you know, to, to normal. We talked about that in our traffic control course, okay? With the GPS nowadays, if you're blocking traffic or rerouting people, it's frustrating because they're following this. They don't know where they are from a hole in the ground they just want to get back to normal, okay? So that's what we want to do. And through our whole process is we want to keep things as close to normal as possible, okay? Um, restoring operational readiness, okay? Get the trucks back in service, okay? So that when the next call comes in, we're ready. And that means that that means cleaning tools, maintaining bottled water, all of those things, making sure that those are all back in stock. And then conducting uh, an, uh, a review, and CISD, okay, so this is the first time they put CISD in the slide, okay, but uh, after incidents like this, that's a part of our after action review, okay, what worked, what didn't, okay, CSID, you know, was anybody, you know, uh, I mean, there's a specific process of how to do that, okay, we talk about what happened, okay, and if it was a fatality or it was something bad, okay, give people a chance to you know, to voice, uh, you know, their opinions, okay? We listen wholeheartedly, okay? It's not, a debriefing is not, you know, all right, I see Johnny's having a little trouble with that. You know what, let's have a little hug in front of everybody. That's not what it's meant to be, okay? It's meant to be, okay, I understand that you're troubled by that. Uh, is anyone else troubled by it? Generally, if one person's troubled, you'll get other people, you know, and that that's a that's a stigma in this, in this industry that, in debriefs, you don't get a lot of people that are, you know, shooting their hand up and saying, yeah, that would kind of affected me. But you look for signs. And when you start getting in, you know, more experience, you're starting to look at people in your crew and say, hmm, you know what, he looks very distant during the briefing. Keep that in your, in your head. And then you talk to your officer, you talk to your chief officer. You know what, I noticed this. You know what, I've got a good report with him. Can I talk to him? Absolutely. You know what? 
I'd rather somebody who has a good comfort level go talk to somebody than call somebody into my office and you know ask you know you, know, you look distant in that at that after that call is everything okay? Are they going to open up to me? Probably not. Okay, but if you've got a tight relationship with somebody, yeah, you know what? Yeah, you know what? I just you know it was just something about that. You know, okay, you know what? Let's let's get this ball rolling. Do you have a question? Uh, what was CIS? What's that? Critical incident stress debriefing. And it's all a part of CISM, critical incident stress management. <laughs> this is huge right now in our in all the tri services. Okay? We've seen these suicides going on. And again, this comes down to I say my opinion and my opinion only, but it's very generational, where uh, the older generation they were not programmed to talk about this. You know, it was like, this is your job. This is what you signed up to do. You do it. Okay. Now you've got the millennials coming in. You know what? Yeah, they signed up for this job. Okay. And I'm here to help. This is what I've signed up to do. Okay. But I know there's inherent risks, but my, my well being is more important than anything. And if something, me working for the employer, if it affects my mental well-being, I'm going to say it, and I'm going to get you to help me. Okay, uh, talking with the you know bigger city fire chiefs, they're saying this is huge with their new recruits. They you know they go to a bad call next day. Nope, taking the day off. Yeah, I was just you know what that just I need I need some time to think about that. And but there's you know what you got lieutenants and captains that are saying, okay, get some help. Right, we understand. But they do a lot of shift changing in the bigger centers because of this, because this generation knows that those resources are available and they are ultimately, their well being is, is most important to them. Where the gen, the baby boomers were like, you know what, the community is, you know what, the, the team, everything's important. And they put their own aside. And then you got us in the generation X in the middle and you know, we some of us started like that, but we certainly understand where we're going now. So you know, we're kind of like at the top of a hump, and I think we're heading downwards. Where in ten years, I don't think you're going to see PTSD as a. It's going to be very prevalent. It'll always be there, but I don't think you're going to see the big, big problems that we're having now with suicides simply because you've got a generation that's not afraid to ask for help, and they've been programmed their whole lives. Ask for help because it's there, and we'll give it to you. Okay, that's my little rant. Uh, okay, chapter three. Can you go to chapter three there for me, John? 